Welcome to our open rehearsal of Most Dangerous Women. This musical documentary begins in 1915. Please turn off your cell phones or put them on vibrate as the ringing of a phone would be out of place in that era. Thank you. I'm going to lower it just a little. Okay, the stage is coming down again. At the end of Act One, there will be a 10 minute intermission after which the play will resume, bringing us from the civil rights era through the present time. Literature about Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and the Arizona Alliance for Peace and Justice is available at the table in the back, including how you can join us or make a contribution to support this production and our ongoing work. We are not allowed to collect any money here. Now please sit back and enjoy our performance. And drums and drums and guns, haru, haru. With your guns and drums and drums and guns, haru, haru. With your guns and drums and drums and guns, the enemy nearly slew ya. Oh, my darling dear, you look so queer. Johnny, I hardly knew ya. Hum, hum, hum. Where are your legs that used to run, haru? Bodied men in France gone to war, leaving Paris a city of women. October, Antwerp falls to Germany. December, British experience airborne shellings of cities. Is this the beginning of full scale air attacks on civilians? Denmark, Switzerland, and the Netherlands remain neutral. 1915, surge of anti German hostility runs throughout Britain. German shops are attacked and looted. Hundreds of top-hatted stockbrokers march to House of Commons demanding the internment of all Germans. Conscientious objectors disenfranchised. April. Russians lose 500,000 at passes. Disease spreads all over Serbia. Dutch journals talk of war. Bulgaria expected to join. British route 15,000 Turks in Mesopotamia. French bombard al -Arish. Italy expects an attack. More Armenians massacred. French line creeps forward. Germans resist fiercely. 
Greek vessel sunk in North Sea. Seven million Poles in need of food. Polish mothers make soup of fur bark. Plight of Jews in eastern war-wrecked areas, pitiable in the extreme. Minds of German soldiers unhinged by horrors of trench warfare. Asylums are full. April 1915, the ninth month of the First World War. More than 1,200 women from a dozen countries converge on The Hague, determined to wage peace. Austria. Belgium. Britain. Canada. Denmark. Germany. Hungary. Italy. The Netherlands. Norway. Sweden. United States. Ex-President Theodore Roosevelt calls them both silly and base. Mrs. Lowell Putnam, sister of the president of Harvard <coughs> University, says, the Women's Peace Party is the most dangerous movement that has threatened our national people for some time. A shipload of hysterical women, says the London Globe. Folly in petticoats, adds the Sunday Pictorial. All Tilbury is laughing at the peacettes, the misguided English women who, baggage in hand, are waiting at Tilbury for a boat to take them to Holland, where they are anxious to talk peace with German frows over the teapot, the Daily Express. Catherine Marshall, leader in the British suffrage movement, responds. I want an educated and responsible public, not an arrogant and prejudiced public, which has taken its opinions ready-made from party newspapers. Her contemporary, Mary Sheepshanks, notes, We plunged into war relief work all the while with the nagging desire to stop the killing. Stop the killing. But it is not enough for women to do relief work. We must use our brains to urge peace among unvindictive lines, leaving no cause for resentment, such as led to another war. Emily, Emily Hobhouse adds, I feel more than ever that men are motivated by greed, fear, and envy, and are incapable of governing the world in a humane way. Put the British Foreign Secretary and the Kaiser each in a separate battleship and let them fight it out. On the evening of April 27th, 47 American women, led by Miss Jane Addams, arrive in time for the opening of the International Congress. Aletta Jacobs, president of the Dutch Suffrage Society and first woman physician in Holland, is keynote speaker. We women judge war differently from men. Men consider in the first place the economic results, the extension of power. We women consider above all the damage to the race and the grief, pain, and misery it entails. We can no longer endure that governments should tolerate brute force as the only solution of international disputes. A thrill seems to stir the audience as the women of various nations utter sympathetic references to the sorrows, the hardships of their sisters. Dr. Anita Augsburg, Germany's first woman judge, speaks. Womanly feelings are above all race hatreds. The German women stretch out their hands for friendship and international love. Jane Addams, probably the most respected woman in America, presides over the conference. She seems to have a certain presence which literally makes others more peaceful in her company. The large floor is completely filled with delegates and the galleries crowded with visitors, both men and women. A solemn earnestness is evident everywhere. Flags of many nations, otherwise so conspicuous in international meetings, are completely absent. The keynote of every speech is woman's revulsion against the barbarity of the present war and her determination to work for the substitution of law for carnage. I find it pleasant and an inspiration to provide, to preside over this first world gathering of womanhood in the interests of peace. The 1,500 women who have come to the Congress in the face of such difficulties must be impelled by some profound and spiritual force. 
in the shadow of the intolerable knowledge of what war means, these women are making solemn protest against that of which they know. Signora Rosa Giannoni, the only Italian delegate, addresses the delegates in French. Nous allons prier pour le monde entier. Joignez-vous à nous. We are going to pray for the entire world. Join us. Et vous verrez que le monde entier devra nous écouter ainsi que les pays. And you will see that the entire world must listen to us as well as to the neutral countries. Et qu'il décide enfin de s'unir pour trouver les moyens d'imposer la fin du carnage, la libération et l'indépendance de toutes les nations. And they will finally decide to unite in order to find a way to end the carnage, a way to liberation and independence for all nations. Et pour qu'à travers cette expérience terrible et sanglante, so les paroles de Christ que tous les belligérants doivent connaître, the words of Christ, which all the must know, pour que ces paroles pardonnent pour connaître un mort puisse enfin embrasser le monde entier. So that the words forgiveness, fraternity, and love may at last embrace the entire world. We must thunder forth a demand for stopping this war in such a voice as will drown the cannon's roar. Rosika Schwimmer, born in Budapest to an upper middle class Jewish family, was a forceful personality. She was someone you either loved or hated. No one can be neutral about her. By the standards of the day, she does not always behave in a way in which women are expected to. She smokes and likes the odd glass of wine. Traditionalists do not take to her bright, loose legging dresses, which bring a follower of the dress reform movement she wears without a corset or a brassiere. <laughs> But only Madame Schwimmer can sweep the Congress off its feet. She suggests a minute's silence for those fallen in battle. The delegates rise in union. We have one among us who has learned that her son has been killed. And women who have learned two days ago that their husbands have been killed. And women who have come from belligerent countries, full of the unspeakable horror of war. These women sit here with their anguish and sorrows, quiet, superb, poised, with only one thought. What can we do to save others from similar sorrow? to put an end to this bloodshed and to begin peace negotiations. 
associations. Recognizing the right of people of self-government urges the governments of all nations for future disputes to put them to arbitration and conciliation. Urges the governments of all nations to unite in bringing social, moral, and economic pressure to bear upon any country which resorts to arms. Since war is commonly brought about not by the mass of people who do not desire it. Since the combined influence of women of all countries is one of the strongest forces in the prevention of war, this Congress advocates universal disarmament. Urges that the organization of the Society of Nations should include a permanent international court of justice. And a permanent international conference. The people should take part in the conference. Resolves that an international meeting of women shall be held at the same time as the conference of powers, which shall frame the terms of the peace settlement. <laughs> Teddy Roosevelt thought women had no business talking peace. They are cowards, said the Rough Rider. They're silly and they're base. War is for men, it always has been, always will be. Stand aside while we brave male warriors take the planet for a ride. They shook their heads and said, we said, there has got to be a better way. There's a way to build a world based on dignity for all. We are off to find solutions at the Great Hay Hall. We can eliminate the causes that lead the world to war. There's a way to peace and freedom. That's what we're looking for. Through the wars of these intrepid women made their way, and they met and they envisioned a glad new day. They told the world that peace was how we all could gain. Some said they're, they're clearly dangerous. dangerous. Some said they're just insane. They shook their heads, the women said, Will you join us in a better way? There's a way to build a world based on dignity for all. We have met to find solutions at the Great Hague Hall. We can eliminate the causes that lead the world to war. There's a way to peace and freedom. That's what we stand for. Now the women weren't just talkers. They set off to see all the heads of state negotiate their simple plea. But the war machine is stubborn and its nature is to grow. When the U.S. joined mid-lonely voices, Rankin voted no. Jeanette M. Rankin, Republican from Montana, the first woman to be elected to the United States Congress. I believe that the first vote I cast is the most significant vote on the act of women, because women are going to have to stop war. And I feel that as the first woman in the Congress of the United States, I should take the first vote, that the first time the first woman has a chance to say no to war, she should say it. Ladies, I want to stand by my country, but I cannot vote for war. I vote no. She's a dagger in the hands of the German propagandists, a dupe of the Kaiser, a member of the Hun army in the United States, and a crying schoolgirl. Jeanette, you'll lose your seat in Congress. Never for one second can I face the idea that I would send young men to be killed for no other reason than to save my seat in Congress. She shook her head and sadly said, I believe there is a better way. There's a way to build a world based on dignity for all. And we women found solutions at the Great Day Hall. We can eliminate the causes that lead the world to war. There's a way to peace and freedom. That's what we stand for. Those of you who know what it means to organize, knows that to get to that first international congress together from February to April, especially in wartime, when you cannot communicate, you will realize what it meant for those splendid women in Holland to get together an international meeting within that short time. People said, all right, 
we see they are coming, but they will come and they will fight and not accomplish anything. But they did not fight. Then the people said that there would be just some talking and nothing will ever happen. And when you realize what did happen, you will realize that this Congress was one of the greatest things that women ever achieved. The War Department must have agreed that something very important had happened at The Hague. In a post-war atmosphere of repression, it listed the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom as a yellow, pacifist, internationalist, pro-German organization. <laughs> <laughs>